Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to church, particular welcome to my Stokes Valley friends. <laughs> it's lovely to see you here. <laughs> You can see that you're loved and welcome and wanted. So it's great to be able to worship God today. We've got uh, the AGM, as you probably know, after the service. We need a quorum of at least 20 people. They say 20 people or 30% of the electoral roll, whichever is less. So less is 20. So we just need 20 people. It should be pretty short and sweet. This year's the years of elections. So we are electing in vestry, people's warden, synod's rep. So people have applied for those. And there are two motions, but they should be again, very short. Uh, so there, the notices, the rest are in your newsletter. So I'm going to pray for the service. The band's already up. You're amazing. Do you know that? You just got up. You just know, don't you? Yeah. So I'll pray for the service and then we'll stand and sing. I pray, come Holy Spirit, you are so welcome in this place. Lord, we want to meet with you. We want to encounter you. Let us never just say we went to church for the day. We've come to encounter you, the true and living God. So Lord, we set aside this time to honor you, to praise you and worship you, Jesus, for you alone are worthy. Amen. Let's stand. Yes, let's stand and sing. There's nothing worth more than will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your prayer. Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Glory, God is what our hearts long 
Lord, it says in the Psalms to enter your courts with thanksgiving and your gates with praise. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Have a seat, everyone. Sunday school teachers, which includes me today, <laughs> if you want to come up. Rihanna and I are doing 10 plus, and Rory's doing 5 to 9, and Emma, or Peter, are you on today with the little guys? So it looked very interesting what you were preparing, Rory. Do you want to tell us about what the 5 to 9 year olds are doing? We're doing about, we're talking about Joshua today, and overcoming fear and being patient and all that sort of stuff. Good, and the little guys, um, under fives on the school in there, we are doing Jonah. And Rihanna and I are doing 10 plus and we're starting with the marshmallow game. Has anyone heard the marshmallow game? Well, to let you know how they got on afterwards, you get a marshmallow and if you manage not to eat it till the end, you get two. So anyway, <laughs> we'll see how they go. Uh, so that's us and we're talking about waiting on God and doing the story of um, Samuel, uh, Saul being asked to wait on God for Samuel to arrive and he doesn't do it and what happens so that's us today. So I'll pray for the kids and then we'll share the peace and go out. I forgot to invite you up, kids. Sorry about that. So Lord, I thank you for um, the children we have in church, Father. And I just pray a real blessing on us as Sunday school teachers today that we feel your joy and your pleasure as we unpack your word with these lovely kids. In Jesus' name, amen. So now we're going to stand and share the peace with one another in a COVID-friendly way by just waving at each other. But the peace of Christ be always with you. So just turn around and wave and smile at someone. <laughs> And I would invite Neil up. He has got the, um, the first reading. The first reading is Palm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all peoples see his glory. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all the gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and the joy on the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I'm doing the second reading as well, so you have to put up with me again. Uh, this is Acts 16, chapter 16 to 34. Paul and Silas in prison once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul came, became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to practice. <clears throat> the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been savagely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. 
About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains became loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Saul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had become to believe in God, he and his whole household. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel this morning comes from John chapter 17, starting at verse 20. Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the Holy Gospel. A seat, everyone. One of the great benefits of, or gifts, I suppose, from God is his peace. So I want to talk about how we keep our peace in very trying and very difficult circumstances. And the reading from Acts is all about that, about Paul and Silas keeping their peace in the midst of really difficult circumstances. The context is this, like Acts is about the missional expansion of the church after Pentecost. So we come across Paul in this missional sort of mode, and he encounters a female slave who has a spirit. She had a demonic spirit, and she would make money by channeling the spirit and fortune-telling. So she was deeply into the occult. And the slave girl kept shouting out about Paul and Silas, saying that, these two are telling you, they're servants of the Most High, and they're telling you how to be saved. And she was obviously doing this for a long time, and she was probably doing it in a really mocking voice, because at some point, Paul gets exasperated, he turns around, and he casts the demonic spirit out of her, which means she can't fortune tell anymore, and she can't make money for her owners. So Paul's action causes conflict. The conflict is in disrupting a successful business. The kingdom of God causes conflict, and it causes conflict in the surrounding culture in two ways. One is when God's power's on display, and that's what happened in the story from Acts, like delivering the skill of the demonic spirit. You also see it in places like um, Elijah on Mount Carmel with the showdown between him and the prophets of Baal. But you also get a clash between the culture and the kingdom when the truth 
of God's kingdom clashes with the values and the truths held by the surrounding culture. So, for example, in Acts 17, you've got this truth clash where the Jews are getting really upset with Paul because he is saying that Jesus is the Messiah. So that's just a, a clash around truth. Even in our Western culture, like for 100 years running up to about the 1970s, the clash would have been with me getting up here and saying that demonic spirits are real and you can cast them out. Because in the height of modernism, like it was into truth, but it had completely got rid of anything that was supernatural. Our, our culture had completely obliterated that from its mindset. So Christians and the churches were even trying to accommodate to that mindset because they were come up with a, a theology that stripped out the supernatural from even the Gospels and from the Bible, and that was called liberal theology. But everything has changed since the 70s. That's not where the point of conflict is anymore. Like, we go sometimes to the mind-body-spirit fear. Like, we go with Jethro, he's this young guy with a mohawk, and he's vicar of St. Augustine's, and he hires out this little sort of patch of ground at the mind-body-spirit fear, and we, for free, we pray for people to be healed, we prophesy over people. Jesus is on display. But right across the aisle, like it's about that much difference, like the aisle down here, are people doing exactly what that slave girl did. They are channeling demonic spirits for money to tell people's fortunes. And I remember in our last church, there was a woman who was doing her nursing degree. And as part of a secular nursing degree that she was doing through the university, she had to go down to Christchurch, and this group of people were going to teach them all, her class, how to get in touch with patients' auras. And she just felt very uncomfortable with that. She prayed that the Holy Spirit would protect her from it. So when they came to her to try and get her aura, they couldn't. And you've got Reiki healing, you've got stuff in the news about all sorts of occult healing. It is all the occult, and it is all through our society now. That is not where the point of conflict where the, with the gospel is. The clash now with our culture and the kingdom is over truth and it is over values. So Paul and Silas get, and that conflict gets manifested itself in the Acts story in litigation. So Paul and Silas, they get dragged before the authorities, the magistrates, and they are facing charges. And the real reason for the charges, the real beef, is that they have ruined these guys' businesses. But it's not dressed up like that. What they say in the charges is that the problem is that Paul and Silas are advocating customs that are unlawful for us Romans to practice or accept. And what they were getting at is that Romans would see Caesar and say that Caesar was Lord, whereas Paul and Silas were saying, that is nonsense, Jesus is Lord, and there was this clash that the real beef was over the money that they couldn't get from the slave girl anymore. Now, the clash between the kingdom of God and our culture often also works out in litigation. And you get litigation where the Christians are being said to have done things that are against certain laws. But the unarticulated point of the conflict is, is that there's this clash of world views going on. Like a Christian worldview holds that the highest and best thing for anybody and for everybody is to know Jesus and that our peace and our happiness comes from putting aside our own desires and living for Jesus. But at the moment in our Western culture, it says that the highest and best value is finding your authentic self and your peace and your happiness will follow from following your desires. That will make you happy. At first blush, you think, oh, well, it's hard yards what God's saying, like give up yourself and, and follow Jesus. But Scripture says do not rely on your own understanding. Like with the current West's model, to make it work, it requires enforced affirmation of everybody. And our mental health statistics are starting to go up and up and up, and the anxiety in society is going up and up and up, and the most anxious group and where, where all that mental health stuff is worst is in Gen Z, which is the very group that has had the most profound exposure to the current Western idea of how you find happiness and what the highest and best value is. So in the reading from Acts, you have 
Paul and Silas, they lose their litigation. The dominant culture wins. So they're thrown into jail, they are flogged, they are stripped, and they are beaten. But Paul and Silas do not lose their peace. They start praying and they start singing their worship songs. Why? How come they keep their peace in a situation like that? How come they don't get enraged with a sort of righteous indignation about their treatment? How come they don't do what we would do and get a news crew there to point out how outrageous this treatment is? How come they keep their peace? The answer is because before any of this happened, they had determined in their own mind that God was right. They'd come to a full knowledge and acceptance of God's truth. They'd internalized and accepted everything that God says. And you can hear that oozing out of Paul's writings. I'll just read out a handful of them. But you can tell that this is a man who has entirely accepted everything that God is saying. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. For when I am powerless... It is then that I'm strong. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in in Christ God forgave you. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the last one, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. So Paul has internalized God's way of seeing the world And consequently, he can trust God in everything and with everything. We lose our peace when we stop trusting God and we start following the world's ways of thinking. So, for example, that happened to me not so long ago. I was around these people, and they were lovely people, but they were worldly people. And for them, the highest and best was your status, your prestige, and your money. And it would sort of manifest itself in little questions like, oh, so when are you going to be a judge? And how come you're not a QC yet? So when you start thinking that way, when you start thinking that those things are the most important thing in the world, you start losing your peace. And I did too. I looked around and thought, well, there's not so much evidence of all the worldly success in my life. And I got educated and I got discontented. And I didn't get my peace back until I trusted God fully again. I didn't get it back until I was all in with God and his ways. You, you can't be halfway with God and have your peace. You can't half die to yourself. You have to fully die to yourself. And we can't trust God with everything and in everything if we don't believe that he's telling us the truth about reality, if we don't believe he's telling us the truth about himself and the truth about what will happen to us personally, as people of faith in the end. And we can get these little burrs under our skin, a bit like the way the devil got to Adam and Eve, getting them to doubt and distrust God. Like He'll get in with little doubts about God's words and about whether we can really believe and trust in the way he sees things should be or we ought to live. So, for example, that happened to me a while ago. I got one of those burrs under my skin, and it was about this odd thing. It was... You know, in the creation account of Adam and Eve, like Adam's created one way and Eve is created in a different way. Now, it's really clear in Scripture that both men and women are created in God's image. So, but what was going on in my head was, well, if we're created in God's image, how come we're not created in an identical method? Why is there a different method for Eve compared with Adam? And one day I was reading my Bible and God spoke to me and he said, the method of your creation is irrelevant. The important point is that both genders are created in my image. They're both equally valuable. The method of creation is is irrelevant. God said that the truth, i.e. that the method of our creation is irrelevant, is really comforting for people who are created in different or unusual ways. Like say you've got, I don't know, surrogacy or a sperm donor situation or IVF and your imagination can run to all sorts of situations that are unusual and not ideal. And God was saying for people in that situation, this account of two different ways of people being created is a comfort. 
because it shows that irrespective of how you were brought into this world, you are still my son, you are still my daughter, because you are made in my image. The method of your making doesn't determine your value. And our peace comes from fully accepting and trusting God. He becomes our peace and our security. The, the situation, though, is flipped if you're not a believer. It's the utter reverse of that. For somebody who's not a believer, the things of God, the ways of God, his point of view are a constant source of irritation and tension. And God intends it that way because it is one of the methods by which he brings people to faith. It's why Jesus says to, said to Paul, it hurts to kick against the goads. He's meaning that it hurts when you're pushing against the things of God, when you are fighting God. You will have anxiety and you won't have peace when you are fighting against the things of God. It also explains why there's this constant rub in our culture between it and Christianity at the moment, whereas other religions, you don't get that rub. Like Buddhism just slides in beautifully. There is no conflict between that and the dominant Western culture at the moment. In the story from Acts, the jailer found his peace. He ex believed in the Lord Jesus. He accepted God's perspective and reality, and he was changed, and he was filled with joy. So I want to finish with this. Like, if there's not peace in your heart right now, it may be because the devil is getting in and just sowing little doubts that are causing you not to trust God and his goodness. It may be that there's an area of your life where you're just butting heads with God. You want him to see things your way rather than you see things his way. Or it may be as simple as refusing to believe that God will forgive you. Or if you have repented of something, refusing to believe that God has forgiven you and the slate is completely clean. So what I thought I might do is maybe if the band could come up, let's stand up because we're going to stand up and sing in a minute anyway. And I'm just going to pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you touch every one of us here. You know the secrets in all of our hearts. You know what troubles us. You know what causes us to lose our peace. And I pray, Lord, that you bring to mind in each of us now that headline issue, that headline thing that is causing us not to have the fullness of peace that you would desire for us, that fullness of happiness and peace and joy. So it may be that for some of you, the Holy Spirit is bringing up that butting heads over an issue and he's wanting you just to surrender, to give up your agenda and just surrender to his. It may be that the Holy Spirit is saying, you just need to repent of that. I will forgive you. I love you. It is going to be fine. You just need to repent of it. It may be that you have repented of something, but you struggle to believe that God has completely, utterly, and fully forgiven you. So whatever the situation is, I just declare over you now the resources from heaven to do the business you need to do with God to get your peace back. And I pray that over the course of the rest of this service, as we worship some more, as we have communion, that the Holy Spirit does a work in your heart so that when you walk out of here, you have that peace restored and you carry it with you every day of your life. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Some song. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, the true and living God, through Jesus Christ. You are the source of life for all creation, and you made us in your own image. In your love for us, you sent your Son to be our Saviour. In the fullness of time, he became incarnate and suffered death on the cross. You raised him in triumph and exalted him in glory. Through him, you send your Holy Spirit upon your church and make us your people. And so we proclaim your glory as we say, 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. To you indeed be glory, almighty God. Because on the night before he died, your son Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come in glory. Therefore, loving God, recalling now Christ's death and resurrection, we ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us in our celebration, that we may be fed with the body and blood of your Son and be filled with your life and goodness. Strengthen us to do your work and to be your body in the world. Unite us in Christ and give us your peace. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. And our amazing worship team is going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. So why don't we kneel as we sing that. Oh, you'll have your little communion thing in front of you, so if you haven't, you can nip out to the back and grab one. But this is the body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Do you want to do it for me? Christ shed for you. Just before we have our final song, and before I read out the words of knowledge, there were two testimonies I wanted to give you. One, um, Megan's going to come up and give. The, the other one was, we were up at Carpenter yesterday, and this guy came up to us and said, oh, I felt really bad that I haven't told you this story, but before COVID, people from this church, we went up to um, Waikanae and we had a healing service. And this guy, I can't, he can't remember who prayed for him, but somebody from the team prayed for him and they prayed for his hearing because his hearing was getting worse and worse and worse. 
He went back to his audiologist after being prayed for, and the audiologist was really glad to see him because it had been about a year since the first time he'd been, and, and when he came back the second time, and the audiologist was getting very worried about him because his hearing was bad back then and it was only going to get worse. So anyway, he repeats the tests on him, and he is gobsmacked to find that the lines on the graph are for normal hearing, like... like the guy felt he could hear fine, but he wanted to go back and get it checked. And I know what that's like because I have hearing issues and you, normally you've got this big drop-off if you've got a hearing problem. His was straight and the doctor kept, the hearing audiologist kept saying, look, look at the graph before and look at it after. He told us that story just yesterday and he's going he's to let us video him and he's going to try and get hold of the graphs before and after so you can see the difference in the guy's hearing. So he could hear. He was healed of deafness. So, Megan, um, yeah. yeah. Quiet. Go God. <laughs> and he... Six weeks ago, my son's girlfriend got COVID, and she lives with us, and my younger son, he has type 1 diabetes, so I was praying quite hard that it would pass over us quite lightly, but... A very small house where there was really no chance to sort of isolate, so I thought it would be, to my mind, impossible that um, my son and I wouldn't get it. But, of course, I mentioned this at um, home group, and Val, and maybe others too, but Val, who has great faith for miracles, prayed that my son and I would not get it at all, and, in fact, that came to pass. So I put that down to prayer. Praise the Lord. That is awesome. So, that's priming you up for prayer ministry. Here are the words of knowledge. Your security is, in the first three, uh, like Bob and Pam got before they came to church and they didn't know what the sermon was, and this is what. Your security is to be found under the wings of the Almighty. Somebody with um, uncontrollable shaking in their hands, and Pam had a vision of people, she, had three, she could see three mountains, and people were going up the mountains in a state of unbelief, but they were encountering God there, they were repenting of their sins, they were being filled with the Holy Spirit and coming down on fire for God. Somebody worried about blood clots, somebody with high blood pressure, somebody who's been hurt, and the encouragement is to come and get some prayer, and people will pray with you to be in a position to be able to pray for the person who hurt you, and that's going to bring healing for you. Somebody with a frozen shoulder, somebody with a heart murmur or heart palpitations, and just the word hope. So if any of that resonates with you, if you've got anything wrong with your body and you want healing, if you want to be prophesied over, we're going to be over there and we're going to pray and we'll just keep praying until um, the prayers finish. But I'm going to hand over to Kath now and her team is going to lead us into our final worship song. Oh, wait a minute, I should bless you all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I just declare over everybody here the peace of God that passes all understanding. Amen. Sing together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope.
that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father are restored Jesus Christ was born then the spirit made the flame now the gospel truth alone shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Darkness we were waiting without hope. 